Hello everyone, I've hit 100,000 followers on Instagram and I am just under 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. So I thought, why not open it up to the people for a solo Q&A? I have the question in front of me, I'm going to run through them and I'm going to sort of waffle a little bit as we go. So question number one, we're starting with the big boy from who underscore LZ. How often do you cry? So it's not something I track, but I do know when I most recently cried and it was a video of a guy dressed as Spider-Man in a children's cancer ward where the kid was suffering with leukemia and he was just so, so happy that Spider-Man was there. And it was a very heartwarming video that I just felt so, so awful for the kid and the parents and the sheer joy and happiness you could see in his face from having Spider-Man in the room with him. You could see that Spider-Man himself was really struggling to hold back tears as the kid was hugging him with joy and really got me going. It's getting me going a little bit right now. I'm not going to lie. So that was the last time I cried in that setting. I think the last time I cried from a general mental health, mental well-being point of view was probably summer, right about the time that I was really deliberating over getting this place, the studio that we're in, the private gym that we're in, the office next door. My home had very much become a workplace, which meant that the way that I was creating boundaries in my head and in my personal life with work and everything were a bit all over the place. Gym in the garage, office upstairs, podcast upstairs, loads of videos there, loads of staff members coming and going. It all just got a bit blurry whereby I didn't feel like I kind of had a home. I had a workplace that I never left, which meant it was very difficult for me to switch off. And there was a point in the middle of summer where I was just a bit of a mess talking to Erin about how much I was struggling with it all and what the solutions were to be. And yeah, cried that evening and sort of came to the solution through determining that we needed a separate office and to finally pull the trigger on something we've been talking about for a long time, but never actually really committed to. We've since committed to it. It has been one of the best things that I have ever done, we have ever done. The difference in my day-to-day -day happiness and well-being through having this place is remarkable. And any doubt or fear that I experienced ahead of time with the decision-making process, the financial commitment, all the work that's been involved, and just the the risk that comes with long lease terms and, and work inputs and spend, etc., is completely alleviated. And I, I wish I'd done it sooner. So beyond that, I can't really think much more in 2023 when I had moments of of tears. But yeah, from a uh, from an emotional spike point of view, I really struggled with Spider Man and a little guy with leukemia and yeah last time emotionally was was around summertime exactly when i'm not quite sure but yeah that is that question from alfie underscore downey who would be your dream guest so i think just due to the absolute intensity of the conversation the amount i'd take away from it personally and the value that other people would take from it personally alex hormozy would be very high on that list just because his ability to disseminate Clarity is just incredible. Different league entirely. If he's a astronaut, I'm a train driver apprentice or something. That's a weird analogy. Does that work? Don't know. Let me know in the comments or message me saying that was a terrible analogy, Fergus. Get your head in gear. But Alex Homos is high. Jordan Peterson at some point in the future, just because it's there's so many threads to pull on in terms of everything he's been through with controversy and everything recently, his his takes on certain things, the 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 fact that he's kind of constantly touring, what that's like from a personal well-being point of view. There's some athletes I'd love to discuss things with Johnny Wilkinson, who's gone from being one of the world's best rugby players to one of the world's most profound men. And actually I'd love to explore how interlinked those things are. There, yeah, there's a myriad of dream guests, but I think the ones that really stick out are, are kind of are kind of those three. There's a long, long list, and I think if I was to just start listing them, we'd be here for a while. But it feels like I'm doing the others a disservice to even pick out those three. But because those are the three that I I came up with right now, let's say those are the ones at the front of my mind, and those are the dream guests within the current context. So maybe at some point I'll just share the long list on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening, you should check us out on YouTube as you can see more there. That is kind of the nature of the platform. But yes, Alfie, that is the dream guest bracket S. And I think that question comes up a little bit more later on. So maybe I'll answer it again and let my thoughts develop throughout this conversation. Question from Lowly Poly. Thinking about stopping alcohol completely, what's your stance? See you drink non-A brackets. So I have thought about stopping alcohol completely many, many times. And 
I honestly think that's just because the dogma of being sober makes it easier for me to have a line in the sand. When in reality, what I found to be most effective is a set of rules around certain things, which means that I only really partake in alcohol consumption as and when it feels justified to me. That does mean that I'm kind of treading on dangerous territory where it's almost as if I'm only binge drinking. And that's not something I want to encourage, but for reference, I keep a well-stocked fridge of days brewing at all times because whenever I get a bit of a desire for a, a lager with a stir fry on a Wednesday evening or there's a rugby match on or I'm watching something exciting and I want to have something to sip on, it, there's just a, yeah, there's, there's a part of me that will always kind of want something crisp, refreshing and alcoholic with that. And having a day's midweek really replaces that and gives me all of the ceremony and engagement that I'd get from a beer. With In social occasions, if all of us are drinking non-alcoholic, then kind of the cheersing effect and the ceremony of a beer kind of creates that, recreates that rather. And that's more than enough for me in those settings. But things like weddings, stag do's, big events where I'm excited about getting people together, I will often compromise and make the choice to affect my recovery, my performance, my cognitive ability for the next couple of days and, and kind of buy in. And that often means that I will reduce my workload, reduce my training load at the back end because I do not do well with hangovers, which is one of the main reasons that I've considered sobriety. But I, so I'm kind of like a part-time, I'm part-time sober, whereby most of the time I'm not drinking, but when I am drinking, I'll, I'll buy in pretty aggressively. And that's a bit of a weird, very non-moderated approach to things, I guess, but I'm British. So there's a part of me that will still enjoy sinking some pints with my mates uh, every once in a while. I've got a wedding that I'm flying to on Monday next week in South Africa. And it would be rude of me not to sample a Loken, the Loken, the local South African, I can see how I made that mistake, wineries available. Am I going to absolutely chuck the kitchen sink at it? Probably not because I'm in a wonderful setting where I can just enjoy being with people that I enjoy spending time with. So I think there's 100% a case for sobriety, but it comes down to how confident you are in your ability to control the week to week, the day to day, and pick your battles. If you struggle to pick those battles and find yourself constantly punning, punishing yourself and beating yourself up because you put yourself in situations where you choose to drink that realistically didn't seem quote unquote worth it, maybe that's where there's a case for a bit more of a dogmatic rule oriented approach. But for me, I make an assessment on any social occasions that warrant drinking and I will therefore factor in the affected recovery and everything that goes with it. But most of the time, week to week, weekend to weekend, I, I don't drink a drop of alcohol. But yeah, next week I'm going to be slamming red wine in Pal in South Africa. So there we are. Don't know if that helps, but that's my take on things. I do recommend getting used to some non-alcoholic options because it kind of replaces the ceremony, which is a good substitution, albeit not a complete straight swap, obviously. But it's a good way of sort of managing the the runway to make a bit more of an informed decision on what's best for you, the individual, because that's what matters. My take on alcohol is kind of irrelevant unless it's something that you find affinity with. And if so, great. If not, hopefully that's given you a few more things to think about. Question from Fitz underscore N underscore starts. Any advice on post-event blues? I always get immensely melancholic following an event. So I've spoken about this quite a lot, and it's something I've suffered with quite aggressively over, over the years. I think the, the double brutal was really quite severe. Ultimately, you're, you're climbing to the top of a hill that you then jump off. You kind of, you work up to the top of the Burj Khalifa on foot and then base jump off is kind of the way that I describe things, where there's a bit of a come down, a bit of a decompression effect on the go, which means that ultimately you can do things to manage it. You can set things up. You can try and mimic the intensity with which you were preparing for an event, but there is just going to be a bit of a recovery period where your the life you've got used to in a training process or a preparation process for the thing means that when the thing has happened, you no longer have as much utility for that process. You obviously need some time to rest and recover. And therefore, you start to not recognize who you are on a day-to-day -day basis because you've gone from being the person that's training twice a day, every day, five days a week, for example, to taking a couple of weeks of doing next to nothing, which means the habits and routines that become very good at holding us accountable and keeping us grounded kind of are washed away. And it doesn't take long for that rhythm to, to break and for us to feel a little bit like we're in a tailspin. So my recommendation is always to try and have something locked and loaded post-event that you can get your teeth stuck into. And that probably shouldn't be a replicable or, or, or a similar 
physical event because you actually like from a recovery point of view if you're going for a best effort in a race you you can't just roll into the next one you will need recovery time physiologically speaking but it might be a case of really getting stuck into a work project really getting stuck into a business project a side hustle art uh, something at the house something you can replicate that intensity of training preparation with that gives you the sort of buzz of hard work input output etc and look it'd be remiss of me not to mention that I have not got this right yet there are still things that I set up and and work into my recovery that I think are going to mitigate the post-event blues, but it still comes. So I think it's develop your toolbox through planning and preparation as much as you can so that when the post-event blues come, you're as well prepared for them as you can be. But also you need to accept that it's just part and parcel of that slow and steady progression to the top of the hill where you then catapult yourself off the other end. And that's a difficult thing to manage. So if you can find a way to replace that process and the intensity that you you became accustomed to in training prep and replace that with something else that isn't physiologically destroying you, then that's a good starting point. But the melancholy that comes with it is completely natural and you're not alone in feeling that way. It's just important to be honest and open with those around you as well so that you can have constant sounding boards to determine how to allocate your time and and sort of make sure that you're feeling like yourself because that's the, been the biggest thing for me is when I go from a real committed training process to a couple of weeks or a month of rest, I feel like I'm not being myself because I'm not doing a lot of the things that I became very used to in the training prep. So hopefully that covers things off. But yeah, be prepared for a downturn. But if you can equip yourself with a little bit more to be to, to manage it, you'll be in a better place. Question from MIJ underscore 9203. What is your favorite and least favorite session? So my favorite training session... <sighs> I don't know of all time or regularly speaking um I still get such a buzz from a proper like peaked gym 1RM max out with the boys sort of event whereby noodle bar smelling salts chalk slaps heavy metal music get in send it loads of caffeine loads of intensity those are really really good fun you obviously can't do them every week because you'd be an absolute shaky wreck but those really are great. I really do enjoy them. I had one recently with Johnny and it was class. Still sticks in my memory. Least favorite? I guess are the ones that are just there for the sake of overall robustness and, and accountability, moving things forward. Things that are just pure assistance movement for the sake of injury prevention or just ticking boxes like monster walks, <laughs> lateral raises, just real simple sessions that don't really have any intensity or any noticeable volume, but you, you should tick the box just to keep things moving forwards. Um... I mean, least favorite, but ironically, probably most favorite is our, our track sessions with specific times to hit because least favorite, they are absolutely gut-wrenchingly hard work, but also most favorite because the reward that you get from hitting the reps and doing that hard work and coming out the other side is fantastic. But yeah, if you ask me to go and do one of them right now, I need a couple of hours to prepare myself mentally. So yeah, I think... Uh, Real, real top intensity, hard work, measurable metric stuff I enjoy in small dosages. And I just, I do really enjoy my long, my long rides, my long runs. Um, it, yeah, it's things, it, it's like zone three tempo stuff midweek that isn't really fast, isn't really slow. And is kind of just there to, to keep developing stuff. That's where I don't get as much of a buzz. But again, I, I appreciate the process and the journey of commitment and discipline and see where that fits into the bigger picture. So as long as you always frame it within that context, then you can make every session exciting and contributive to your bigger picture goals, which is why having bigger picture goals to work back from is so important. Question from Johannes Rye, what's your Everest? As in the one athletic goal in life, brackets that might even seem unrealistic at the moment. Could be Everest, to be fair. Honestly, I think in the next few years, I'd like to get in a position where the YouTube channel and my training goals become sort of bucket listy, where once a year I'm doing A to B something, using fitness endurance as a mechanism for storytelling and personal experience selfishly i'll enjoy the process of course like swimming the channel like doing an 8000 meter 8000 meter peak like running lands ends on a groats like running a lap of jersey i don't know all these things that are quite intimidating but very much grounded in a natural environment and a kind of bucket listy that that's kind of where my head goes on the long term. 
I don't think there is a there isn't a like golden dream North Star project that I'm constantly got in front of mind when I'm thinking about things. I have thought at length about whether I would like to do Everest at some point. I've actually had discussions in the past about the, the cost implications and there was a team that was sort of loosely being like, oh, do you want to come on our expedition for it? And the question I think you need to ask yourself is, for that experience, are you willing to die? And that sounds very morbid, but it is quite morbid because the, the odds are not in your favor, particularly. So to experience the highest point of the world and do something that such a small, small percentage of the population that ever will exist achieve, are you willing to risk your life for that? I don't think I am. Even if I wasn't married with ambitions of having children, would I have more of an ego that would make me feel like I wanted to do that? I don't know. But I, I feel that I can achieve more that's individual and intrinsically exciting to me that doesn't require me putting myself in such risk from a fatalistic point of view. So yeah, there isn't actually an answer because I kind of take everything one year at a time because at the end of the day, all of my training processes and decisions are driven by curiosity as my main guiding principle. If I wake up in the morning and it makes me curious and excited, I will do it. If it doesn't, I will not. And right now, there isn't anything that I'm not currently training for or thinking about for the next sort of 12 to 18 months that is in that category, but I'm not acting upon, if that makes sense. Paddy847, what tape do you use to help manage blisters on your feet? This is going to upset a lot of people, but I have never struggled with blisters on my feet, whether that's because I wear open toe box shoes and I've always got on really well with specific brands of socks. I, I don't know. But yeah, blisters have never really been dehabilitating for me in any ultra endurance stuff other than when I've had a new pair of shoes in training. But by then I've broken them in so much that that isn't a problem when it comes to race day. Hot spots I've had issues with, but they are kind of just superficial enigmas in terms of, well, this feels like a massive blister, but is actually just nothing. And they've been pretty irritating and kind of sore, but it hasn't been real blistery stuff. I've had chafing up on my neck from wetsuit stuff. I've had chafing in my armpits from swimming and that's uncomfortable, but it's not, it, it, it's just superficial pain really. Oh, saddle sores though, to be fair. I've got, I get really bad saddle sores. Um, so yeah, to, to divert attention to a part of my body that you probably didn't expect to hear about on this podcast, to be honest. Let's just say, uh, whilst I don't get blisters on, on my feet, which I'm very fortunate for, my gooch at points during cycling prep will have seen better days, which is something I'm not particularly grateful for. So there we are. But you'll be pleased to hear I don't actually tape my gooch. So do with that information as you will. Question from London underscore France underscore underpants. Do you supply underpants from London and France or is that a rhyme? Interesting, interesting, interesting. Or is, it surna is your surname underpants? I don't know. How do you manage all of your data from Garmin, Whoop, Bike, Computer, Strava? So all of my training is loaded in Training Peaks, which is kind of the central database. I interact with my Whoop on a day-to-day -day basis from a sort of day-to-day -day journaling, day-to-day -day checking in on that point of view, changing what my evening routine, morning routines look like around that. Garmin, I put on when I'm doing an activity. I hit start. I do the activity, I let it upload to Strava and Training Peaks, and then I take my Garmin off. I don't wear my Garmin on a day-to-day -day basis. I wear, I'm into other watches, so I like wearing actual watches and having my Whoop on 24-7. So my Garmin tracks my activity, also uploads it to Strava and Training Peaks, and then I'll use Training Peaks as the central tracking mechanism for that. Uh, bike computer, again, auto uploads to Training Peaks, auto uploads to Strava. So when I'm on my bike computer, I will hit start, I will do my session, I will hit stop, and then forget about it. B yeah, beyond that. Whoop is the one I interact with most on a day-to-day -day basis, and then Training Peaks I'm on on a desktop point of view pretty much every day programming for our athletes, but also I dive into my own data to sort of track trends. And then Strava I just kind of use so that people can keep up to date with how I'm training from a sort of social network point of view. Um what I will use Strava for is is I'll check like lap data and heart rate data within certain frameworks in Strava rather than Garmin Connect because I just find Strava a little bit more intuitive to use. Um, but the, well, I was going to say something else there. What was I going to say? Strava, social network, don't use my Garmin for that. 
Um, oh, yes. Other thing to mention is I don't actually track everything on my Garmin at the moment. I'm doing a lot of runs based on RPE and feel just because I'm trying to get really, really conditioned to feeling my way through pacing. Um, and I've quite liked not relying on data to be able to do that. So yeah, I'm doing two or three runs a week that aren't on Strava at the moment and have been quite consistently, um, especially whilst I've been managing fatigue and, and pain in my hip around a bit of a niggle that's 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 being well managed, I should say, and is, is in a good place. But yeah, not all of my training is on Strava. I've had a few people message me in the past being like, oh, I'm surprised your volume is only this much with this coming up. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, I've been looking at your Strava. I'm like, well, okay, cool. I'm not that's that's not it so if you're looking at my strava thinking that is absolutely everything i'm doing it's not um will it ever be probably not because i don't track training sessions in the gym with my garmin etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm not nearly as asked about social network training data as i am just training but yeah my runs rides yeah my outdoor runs trapped with a garmin my rides on a bike computer will be auto uploaded anything on a turbo train will be auto uploaded as well to training peaks and to strava and then that's how i use it so hopefully that makes sense but whoop i treat is a separate entity whereby i go into it every morning i journal in there just give a bit of an overview of how i felt the night before how i felt that morning check my data see if everything aligns with how i feel and then if it doesn't i'll then kind of make a decision based on everything i've got to consider as to whether i need to go to bed earlier whether i need to change some habits throughout the week whether i need to adjust workload etc 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 but what i don't do is i don't change the training plan day to day based on my whoop i use whoop as a lifestyle tracker where i'll take accountability on sleep recovery food hydration nutrition workload around that so that i can continue to stick to the training plan if that makes sense question from chris woods 17 hi hi chris how do you manage your asthma whilst running in colder climates and does it flare up ever? So from generally December to March, I cannot do high intensity work outside. Anything over 155, 160 heart rate, my asthma will blow up and it will really, really damage me. And actually, if it blows up to that point, it kind of affects me for a few days. So if it's below five degrees, I can't really do any hard effort stuff outside. I'll tend to do intervals on a turbo trainer or a treadmill. And that's been the case for... I mean, 20 years or so at this point. It's been a very, very long time. Um, summer, as long as I have a puff of inhaler before I do anything, I'm fine. If I'm ever having any, having any respiratory issues with a flu or cold or an illness or something like that, I do need to be a bit more mindful. If I'm ever staying in, in places that might be a little bit dustier, et cetera, I need to be a bit more mindful. Cats flare it up as well, so I need to be mindful of cats. Uh, there's actually one that wanders its way into our front garden and shits in it quite regularly these days, so can't go out and tell that cat off because it'll make me wheezy which is a difficult position to be in but yeah in terms of management i don't have a preventer because it hasn't really actually helped me that much over the years i just rely on um, a couple of puffs of my reliever before exercise and then i just accept from december through to march i don't really do any high high intensity stuff outdoors because it will destroy me so yeah I can manage aerobic volume, list volume, up to sort of zone three volume, no problem. But beyond that, yeah, it really gets me. Question from Sam.Fluers. What are your 2024 goals, both personal and business? So March, training-wise, I mean, you didn't actually say that, but I assume that's part of it. March, run 250k in one go. Second half of the year, to be confirmed. Business-wise, we've got some clear um, revenue targets for the year. We have some clear hiring and people targets for the year we this is across both businesses generally speaking but the main aim is just to consolidate a lot of the systems and operations that we have on a day-to-day -day basis to make them a bit more efficient and streamlined i'm currently working through a big batch of work on just getting our crm for the whole team a bit more secure and, and clear so that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet a little bit too much scattiness with day-to-day -day diary management file management and things like that that we can work to improve but it's very flat out which means finding the time to do the work to make these things better is quite difficult um so yeah clear revenue targets clear personnel total targets and sort of solving some problems uh, from a personal point of view there's not actually really anything that isn't tied in with the business side of things have no ambitions to move house um have no ambitions to get married did that last year so don't plan on doing that again this year i think it's fair to say 
Um, probably want to spend a, you know I want to spend a bit more time present and available with Erin in the evenings and if we go away generally speaking for the past five six years whenever we've gone away it's been for a specific purpose it hasn't been a holiday and we've we've had a day or two either side of said specific purpose but it's always been for a race or a meeting or a business thing so I want to get better at that um, yeah nothing too specific really it's kind of just general the, the revenue targets are the main ones um and then we'd love to hit ten thousand total athletes served through omnia by the end of 2024 there are a lot of bigger structural things happening that we're going to be moving towards come 2025 but probably not the setting to discuss that just yet because we're still developing a lot of ideas but loads and loads of exciting stuff happening immediately which is very cool. Um, quite stressful at the moment, if I'm honest, but all very exciting and come from a good place. We've had a few events out of the office already, out of HQ, which have been remarkable. Had 160 people throughout the day come and join me for a 50K in Battersea Park on Saturday. So that was fantastic. And you might have noticed I didn't do it in Alpha Flies and 750 quid's worth of running clothing, which is very non-Southwest London, it must be said. But was very very positive so everything is in a really good place bandwidth is our biggest challenge at the moment and i just want to get a little bit more time day to day doing the things that i'm good at and enjoy rather than just sort of doing pure operational stuff um if that makes sense so yeah nothing too clear this year i don't have as many real specific goals other than the few north star ones even things like youtube and, and instagram like follow account beyond a hundred thousand I, I i don't I don't really care like the numbers have never really been that important to me i'm, I'm very good at not attaching my identity to the analytics on the screen and um, but i think in terms of reach and absorbing more people into what we want to achieve and how we want to move things forward and how we want to get the community more developed and things obviously the more people the better but um yeah I, there's no part i mean that's going to end myself trying to get to 200,000 Instagram followers or YouTube subs by the end of the year. I'm kind of, I'm past that. I wanted to hit 100,000 in 2024. Didn't manage that. Looking like that's going to happen in the next week and a half. Um, really want to grow the podcast now we've got the studio. So lots of general growth. I mean, there's there are specific KPIs and things at my end that I've got, but they're in my iPhone notes. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're not as easy to just give you the pithy answer you're probably looking for. So that was waffly. Wow. But hopefully that makes sense. Question from Nick underscore Crads. What got you into all these challenges? So I was sat in a coffee shop in Brixton in 2018 with a salted caramel brownie and a flat white. I opened up my work to do some, I opened up my laptop to do some work for Heineken at the time. I just got hit with this overwhelming sense of white noise and stress and immediately felt, oh, just get on with it. Just stop being a pussy. Sort of very hyper-masculine response. But I then called myself out on it and promised not to make the same mistake I did from 2014 to 2016 when I was suffering with severe depression and I started asking myself the question right what are you missing what's making you feel like this a sense of fulfillment how can you find one so long story short I committed to my first fundraising event by attempting to squat half a million kilos in 24 hours along the way connected with Johnny really built up my endurance base along the way whilst maintaining a lot of my strength because I was coming from a pure powerlifting background so I had a lot of strength to hold on to basically and fell in love with the style of training, fell in love with the process of fundraising for Movember, something I was very, very passionate about. Just started posting stuff on my own social media as a way of saying, look at how hard my training is, donate money, please. And did that for about three years across three different campaigns. And then kind of accidentally found ourselves in a position of authority in the hybrid training space, uh, given that Johnny was a real key part of creating the original concept and term in 2013 to 2015 when Alex Viada wrote the book. So yeah, we found ourselves in a position of authority and that's where Omnia and the Modern Mind was born, really, was the Modern Mind's kind of a reflection of the corporate, school, fundraising, charitable, mental health, well-being side of what I do. And then Omnia was a reflection of the, the training, the big events, the charity, sorry, the um, the challenges, the the physical demand, the strength, the endurance and, and everything in between. So essentially, I got here by accident. So committed to something I was passionate about, made it up as I went along, just went hell for leather and figured things out as I went. And here we are, accidentally, f f 28, oh, yeah, it's almost six years later, which is which is great. So having raised over £100,000 from November along the way, I, I should very proudly say. So yeah, basically, make it up as you go along and good things will happen is kind of the, the mantra that I've, I've led my life by since then. 
Cole.Cambro. A few questions from Cole, who is a fellow podcaster and fellow Scotsman over in Glasgow, though. So, you know, you know, boo. What's an area of work that you can better handle the pain than others in your industry slash field? So I don't have an agent. I do all of my commercial conversations myself. And I think that's largely just because out of convenience and the way that the cookie has crumbled over the years that I've been forced to have a lot of the conversations along the way. And in doing so have got over that discomfort of having those conversations where I can just view things objectively. So I am in no way afraid or uncomfortable about talking about numbers, figures, value, where it does start to get a bit difficult is where you're sort of speaking with the someone who's also a friend and you kind of need to you need to go back and forth quite aggressively on some things but that's just the skill of negotiation and people skills but yeah from a commercial point of view i don't have an agent i think i probably i, I would i would like one just to help the workload side of things but i'm not I, I i am very comfortable having difficult conversations through having had many iterations of that and having spoken to a lot of people that i know in the space that's potentially something that i'm a little bit more experienced in um I, I mean, obviously, I have a huge tolerance for training volume and, and and the time management around getting that done, which means that we've been able to achieve things that that have brought people into the the, the ecosystem. Um, but I mean, yeah, at the end, of the, this sounds arrogant to say, but I fully just back my work ethic. Jamie, who's sat behind the camera, my brother, we have very similar work ethics. We we've always just kind of done what needs done if we see why it needs to be done then we're, we're completely bought in and if we're passionate about something you kind of can't you can't hold us down um and i think that that's a real key component of the growth that we're having currently which is fantastic uh i'm not gonna do the arrogant arrogant thing and say hardest worker in the room bullshit like that because i've already mentioned alex hormozy on that i think he probably wins but it's more a case of yeah i i i I, I'm very confident that, objectively speaking, I give everything I can on a week-by-week -week basis to every facet of what's going on. Um, and sometimes that's overly optimistic because human beings can't do everything. So I try and do everything that I can. Sometimes I fall a bit short, but it's then what you do next. How do you recalibrate on that? And how do you learn lessons so that you can be more efficient on a week-by-week -week basis? So again, a bit of a waffly answer, but I think I've become very comfortable in uncomfortable commercial conversations obviously very comfortable in long endurance, difficult climates, et cetera, et cetera. And then from a work ethic point of view, I'm kind of just not afraid to to do what needs done on a week by week basis, travel, limited sleep, all of those things. It's kind of, if I see a reason for it, it, it just makes sense to me. And I kind of see past the potential cons or discomfort that goes with it. Um, and that's something I'm really thankful to my parents and upbringing for by exposing us to so many sports and different communities growing up. I think that's a real core component of that. So I hope to do the same for my future children that do not yet exist. Cole.Cambro again, what's been the biggest driver of your growth? Uh, I think, well, no, I think actually there's a lot of things I could have done differently that would have grown the YouTube channel and the Instagram a lot quicker like just focusing on viral reels, viral video titles, et cetera, et cetera. But I've kind of never really wanted to do that because if I can't, if I'm not authentically presenting and creating content that I want to create, I will not like creating it. And there's too many things going on for me to spend time creating things I don't want to create. So I think the, the grounding principle of kind of only creating authentic content has continued to develop everything with a really engaged community behind it and has also allowed me con to continue to focus on growth rather than just constantly looking for social media metrics here there and everywhere which could get things up and up and up but yeah i i i have no interest in being a content creator only i think that would be that wouldn't fulfill me across all of the ways in which i would like to be fulfilled from a business demand people demand commercial demand point of view etc I wouldn't want to be a full-time athlete because, again, I'd be just managing training all the time. So all of the pillars that input into my life, I think holding myself accountable to doing them because I want to be doing them and focusing on those things means that whilst the growth in terms of numbers is probably slower than an equivalent timeline and content output would equal to, I think what we've achieved along the way through holding ourselves accountable to only doing what we want to be doing and holding ourselves to an authentic version of us means that the community that we have are really engaged and we're really happy to have here there's no fluff and whilst there'll still be rogue youtube comments and the odd rogue instagram dm 
generally speaking, we're really confident in the community that we've built and and the the growth that's come with that. So yeah, I think that's kind of the core of it. But I could be focusing on nothing but trending sounds and viral reels and things and could have 250,000 followers by now, but it's just a number on a page. That's all it is. It's kind of it's what you do with it, how you how you engage that community and for us, it's all about storytelling. How can endurance events and training events act as a gateway drug for people to try more things that scare them? And that's why YouTube for me, podcast for me, is such important sort of mechanisms because long form allows context, it allows detail. And yeah, that's just that's just where I feel more comfortable. And I think that's what's resonated with people more over the years is, is that storytelling, pulling things out of these events that aren't just performance driven, it's more human driven. Um, but that's what fascinates me. That's what makes me curious. So that's what we've created and people seem to have vibed with it, which is good news. On that topic, question from Jarno Welp. When did you start YouTube and how long did it take to see success? So I started posting, again, I posted a few videos that were designed to just get people donating to Movember in like 2019, I think. Um, but I actually started posting consistently in January 2020 until February 2020. I then stopped and then started again in summer of 2020 as I was training for the 500 pound squat and sub five minute mile on the same day, which I managed to achieve in July. And then from there, it's been a video a week for, yeah, three and a half years. And I'd say until last year, it was massive diminishing returns, whereby it cost way more in terms of money and time inputted than it got back. But the consistent output over all those years has now led to the point where YouTube is a really, really main platform, really enjoyable platform, really detailed platform, and something we've really upskilled ourselves in and confident in what we create. And it's the one that has the biggest archival and sort of search history dominant reach, which is fantastic. So if we talk about building your aerobic volume, we can have people find us that didn't know we existed, didn't know I existed, didn't know about the things that we're talking about in the video, whereas you just don't get that with other platforms. And whilst it requires a lot more input, a lot more thought, a lot more time, it's very, very rewarding when you cross that threshold. So I, I will always say to people, do not bother starting a YouTube channel until you unequivocally can commit to at least one video a week for an extended period of time. If you do not hold yourself accountable to that rule, there's no point in starting in the first place. And if you do three, four videos that you think are sick and you don't then have 10,000 subs, you're like, oh, that's it, I failed. That's, that's not what it is. It's Make content that you enjoy making, make content that you find interesting and try and find a way so that it doesn't it doesn't take from you and it's actually an enjoyable process. And if you do that every day, every week for a year, you'll be a very different person at the end of it, whether that's with subscribe account, community engagement, or even just your ability to film yourself, talk on camera, even your ability to edit, your understanding of Adobe, your understanding of Final Cut Pro, all these things. I mean, best case scenario, you might have a huge audience, you might have all these commercial opportunities, you might have trips around the world, you might have all this fun stuff that goes with it. So... Yeah, YouTube's very, very tough. Still feels like a massive side hustle for me because the business is very much the day job um, and YouTube still feels like something I need to fit in around that, which is not the way it should be. That's kind of a bandwidth management thing at my end. But I'd say success on YouTube for me only, I've only started to feel quote unquote successful on YouTube as of yeah, kind of mid last year, but there's still so much more for me to learn, me to do better because it's there's so many working parts. I mean, thumbnails and titles, I'm shit at, shit at. So the more expertise I can lean on for that stuff, great. Sometimes we get a little bit too cinematic and don't think about hooks and engagement and audience retention rate. But again, if I get too bogged down in the weeds of that, I stop enjoying it. So if we focus on what we want to make, we keep putting that out there. People seem to enjoy it. And if that means that we're not going to get pushed like mad for only eating pink food for 24 hours to a random audience on YouTube, then so be it. I can make my peace with that because we're having a good time absorbing other hybrid athletes from all over the world, having fantastic conversations with guests on The Modern Mind, and just doing lots of fun shit that's really rewarding and fruitful at my end, our end, along the way. So I'm going to keep doing that and see what happens. As I said, making it up as I go along, and that hasn't failed me yet. Gregor Hans, do you run in barefoot shoes? And if so, what sort of distances do you tend to do? No, I do not run in barefoot shoes on concrete. I will sometimes run up to 15K in trails in the Pentlands in the Vivo Barefoot firm ground trails. And that's, yeah, no more than 15K. 
the, the fact that this question comes to me so often is very reflective of old style marketing around barefoot shoes, which is if you aren't in barefoot shoes all the time, then fuck you is kind of the message it used to be. But it doesn't need to be that. A study out of Liverpool University with Chris De Oot and Rory Curtis indicated that just by wearing a pair of Vivo barefoot shoes for six months, you can improve your foot strength by up to 60% which means that simply by walking the dog, walking to the shops, walking to work, doing your 5,000 steps at lunchtime in a pair of Vivos, you will, you will reap most of the rewards of wearing a pair of barefoot shoes without having to even think about doing any running volume in them. If you want to run in them, great, but you don't need to run in them. And actually the benefits of running in a research point of view aren't actually that well developed. It can be a very useful tool for you to engage with your gait because there's no way that you can slam your heel and overstride in a pair of barefoot shoes because you'll feel it. Whereas a really hyper cushioned pair of hokers, for example, you might disguise that and that's where shin splints and hip pain and knee pain can develop. But yeah, running long volume in vivos, the question would always be why? And if it's because you want to run naturally and like our ancestors did, then that's absolutely fantastic. If you think it's because you should because shoes are really bad, then it depends on the context. If you're trying to go sub three in a marathon, then use a carbon plate. It'll make you quicker. It's free speed. If you're not, and you just want to enjoy running and you want to feel grounded and connected to the floor, then a pair of barefoot shoes is fantastic. I, I advocate for people having a pair of barefoot shoes for simple uses and wearing them day in, day out. I wear them every day, but I run in ultras and a variety of other shoes. So yeah, my, my recommendation is get a pair for a specific purpose and then decide how much you want to interact with them or how little you want to interact with them moving forwards. But there is no need to run long distances in barefoot shoes unless you have an intrinsic self-driven reason to do that, if that makes sense. Okay, final question. Question from Tim Nielsen. Um, what would your main tip be for somebody wanting to start their own documentation of training? I've kind of already covered it, but don't make content for other people first. Make content for yourself. And in doing so, you'll kind of be creating your own niche by finding people that also like that style of stuff. And it will be easier and more efficient to do. You want to be churning out as much as you can for as little input as you can to start with and learn all the lessons, make all the mistakes as quickly as you can. I dragged out a lot of the mistakes that I made from a YouTube point of view over an 18 month to two year period because I was just kind of not really tapping into any expertise around me and just kind of documenting everything and documenting the wrong things, not thinking too critically about it. But I think there's a real tendency to think that you need a team with mad expensive cameras and this, that and the other to start with. We've seen how far people can go just leveraging iPhones, leveraging, I mean, maybe Androids, I don't know. But you don't need an A7S three with a 15 grand lens to get started. You don't need this. You don't need that. You can just get going with a GoPro. You can do a lot of work with just a GoPro. And there's, I mean, you can get yourself set up for 300, 400 quid. And then it's just a case of, right, how do I film what I want to talk about most effectively? How do I then get that into an editing software to make the most of it? How do I then bring that to life and edit it in a way that's engaging? So I'm maximizing my input into what I've done here. And the longer you do that, the more you'll learn, the better you'll get, and the more outputs you'll have over the back end. Um, but the, the question I'd start with is, why do you want to document your training? Is it because it's rewarding? Is it because you want it to be your living? Is it because you want to sell a product? Is it because you want a contract from this company? That's a really important question to ask yourself, because if you do go into it for the wrong reasons, you won't enjoy it, you won't stick to it. And I say again, if you're going to be documenting something and you're going to commit to it, Either invest the time and invest the consistency or don't bother because you'll be wasting your time to start with. And if your ego can't handle delayed gratification and steady growth, then it's probably not going to be the game to focus on. And that's where TikTok or chasing virality on Instagram might be an easier option because you're kind of feeding feeding a trend and an algorithm, which means that you can you can you can create stuff with the sake of trying to maximize its reach. But if you're creating stuff for a purpose and a mission, then I, I think it's a little bit more a deliberated process. And I don't mean that to sound that critical, but it depends. Again, it all comes back to why are you, why are you creating, why are you documenting training, creating content in the first place? What is, what are you hoping to achieve? If it's followers, you can focus on a little bit more short, short form stuff. Cause that's the way to really blow up. If it's engagement community, real authentic, real long-term driven stuff, then longer form content and ma making your other platform stuff a little bit more focused on what you want to be creating is a driving factor. It's where podcasts are great. 
Podcasts are fantastic. You can speak to interesting people. You can have monologues like this one today and learn, th learn some things about yourself along the way. And there's loads of content you can chop up off the back of this. So yeah, ask yourself, as with all things, training, business, content, relationships, why are you asking yourself these questions? What is your why? Work backwards from there. The end. The end. So thank you very much for listening or watching, depending on where you are. Enjoyed that. And I'll be doing some more of these as we cross some other milestones. I'll probably do them once a quarter, give or take. So if you are keen to ask some more questions, keep an eye out on Instagram stories. Um, I'll probably put it on Strava and YouTube community posts and things like that. If you do want to ask questions and I will get to them in the future. But that is that. Welcome. No, not welcome. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Modern Mind. And I will see you next time.